I'm just gonna get going a little early because uh, Dr. Vivek Murphy is gonna join me in a second. And I just wanted to take a sec to say hi before it starts. Hey guys, just uh, so like we're all so new to Instagram Live that uh, I just I just wanted to check in and see how you guys are doing before we get a chance to talk to Vivek Murphy. Um, man, everyone's going through such a hard time. I'm just wondering if we could take a sec and just see how you guys are doing. Are most people at home or do they have totally, do you guys have totally bananas jobs right now? What are you guys doing? I feel like there's two kinds of people right now. There's like inside people and outside people. Like all of us who are inside wishing we could do more and yet totally tired. Oh man, it's so good to hear from you guys. It's uh, and then there's the outside people where they're like first responders and oh man, yes, the lockdown people, exactly. And teaching at home. Man. Oh, and you're at a co-op, bless you, seeing people every day, managing fear. Oh my gosh, yes. And like, it's so true about extroversion. Like, who are we when we're like confined to this totally limited economy we're suddenly in? Oh, day 14, and now you're trying to be a student. There's just so many ways where like the world just collapsed into this really tiny thing but people are doing beautiful things. Like, did you hear that there's no more dogs to foster? Not no more, but like so few dogs to foster in uh, in New York right now because people have their dogs and their... <laughs> and my roommate from college is here. She, uh, she started this absolutely hilarious Instagram account to make me laugh just with uh, these uh, stuffed gorillas who work remotely. They just like do so many things remotely. So that's important for gorillas. Man, bless you guys for all the jobs you have that are like putting you in connection with people in the greatest degree of need right now. There's like a whole bandwidth to the day that you guys are having where like, I know you can feel it, right? Like this is the time where you kind of hit the wall on the world and man, and then we hit the wall in the week where it's hard to even know like what is a Friday? <laughs> oh, thanks for asking how I am. I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm actually, today feels okay. I would hit the wall a little earlier, but um, but then I like brought it back. I'm also like not super good with technology. So when you guys see the thing that says Vivek Murphy, like let me know, cause then I'll have to, then I'll have to like actually click join. How are you guys doing? I Does it feel like a Friday to you? I I never quite, I feel like we need like a whole new rhythm to how the week feels. And then we need like a different thing for whatever the weekend is supposed to be. Man, and chaplains, you guys, you have the most beautiful jobs. And like, oh man, what are you doing to change things up every day? I wish I could show you my other room where, um, and <laughs> where it's like, I've got my crazy calendar. And uh, just to try to create differentiation, it's so hard. This is my office, which I'm so glad I just decorated with unbelievably dumb things. Can I show you a couple of my dumb things before Dr. Murphy comes? This is my like, I am truly Canadian, welcome to the queen. How great is that? That's a portrait. I got a copy of a portrait from my parents in the 70s because <laughs> they were both very attractive at that time. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's been nice to just like find us lately. And then the cutest thing in the whole world, that's my mom, that's my dad, which I love. And, um, and, then, and then my sister does these gorgeous, like she takes Instagram photos and then she like draws little, she's like such a beautiful doodler and then she makes it more and more. So she, she does these like gorgeous Instagram things of like big moments. So there's like me and my dad when I went to go see the world's largest um, Noah's Ark. There's contenders for that one, by the way. And uh, and then like Zach with his grandpa's glasses. And, and then, and this is my cutest like doing things for no reason. You know when you have a parent that just like doesn't understand what your job is? They just doesn't know. My grandma, who actually was shut in from tuberculosis, which was wildly contagious at the time, she had a really tough life. And uh, she wanted so much later on when she finally had a child to be able to relate to him, but my dad, went into this crazy nerdy profession 
and she was just like, what do you do? And, you know, she's from a farm in Saskatchewan, and all of a sudden she has a dad who, like, a son who, like, is into Tudor history. So, like, what do you do? The answer is she made him a cross stitch. She, like, spent, like, a year embroidering him, like, a cross stitch of the subject of his dissertation and, like, ordered pearls, like, to sew in and just, like, beautiful little things to connect with someone that, she otherwise could not have known. So I love the fact that sometimes in the things that we do that feel kind of like excessive and dumb and beautiful, like for no reason kinds of things that we can find like really intense connection with each other and and like moments of big joy. So I try to like use this, this is like where I do my writing. So I try to use that to connect with people in my life that sort of overwhelm me with their love. I'm seeing here, I started neuroplasticity training and it's the best tool. Wait, I'm so interested in how people are using their professions to like tap into these deep resources we have. I feel like chaplains knew this all along, right? That we're all trying to spend the day loving other people and then recovering from how it feels to love other people. <laughs> it's just like, it is an intense time to have an open heart. Um, so many of my friends are journalists right now and I feel like they've got this like, gosh, so we have this, uh, we have this thing we do every day, me and my journalist friends where they start, oh my gosh, and thank you for praying for me. They, they send me this thing where, um, it's like, it's 9am and, and so for us today, I got the one from a journalist that was like, it's 9am and the British prime minister has coronavirus. So we're like, ah, so it's, it's been helpful just to have people we like check our reality against before we like go into a little, go into our like work bubble where we figure out how to do the best we can with what we can. And um, I just, I so admire the fact that we have so many open hearted people who are like feeling the edges of what they know how to do. I was just talking to my friend, uh, Sunita Puri. She was, uh, she wrote this gorgeous book. We have a podcast that's coming out soon about um, her beautiful memoir called That Good Night about palliative care. And uh, she was just saying like, she was at the hospital and it's bananas there. And so I'm so glad we have so many people that we can like, we can be responsible for loving. And I think that's kind of, I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to talk to Dr. Murthy about today. He, um, so I think he's gonna come in a minute. So can I just, if you don't mind, I'll just like tell you about how great he is before he gets here. Okay, so first of all, he's like the nicest ever. He's like the nicest ever. He's like sweet and soft-spoken, but like poetic in a way that you're like, did you just come up with that? Yes, yes he did. Um, so when he was Surgeon General, 19th Surgeon General, do we, can, Canadians have Surgeon General? I just like, I, I just like do not know them as much as I know your American ones. And um, so what they do when they start uh, these jobs is they travel around the country listening. Like they go on, if they're smart and they're cool, then they go on these listening tours. And um, and uh, he, I just got a note that said he's working on getting on right now, so he'll be here for a sec. Oh, and thanks for listening to my podcast with him. He's so nice. So we're going to kind of pick up where we left off there because he taught me things like really quickly about what he learned when he was, um, is, I'm just checking, is, I, I'm getting a request from, and I'm hoping it's, I just need to make sure that's not from him. Is it Demanda Chio? Let's learn together if that's from him. <laughs> okay, guys, we're going to figure it out. Um, so no, so, so great. Sorry. Um, so he went around listening and what he learned was we have all these diseases everywhere, right? And all this like very intense pain. But what he learned so much so quickly was that, um, was that like one of the deepest pains people had was loneliness, but they didn't have the language. Like who has the language to say, um, I'm, I'm lonely because when they said it, it felt a lot like saying like I'm unpopular or there's a reason why I'm by myself. And now that we're all alone in a different way, like we're, we have to stay separate. I think we need new language to figure out how it feels to be apart and, uh, awe. and thanks for man, people, their dads, colon and liver resection man bless you we'll be praying for you it's such a tough time to be tender and um especially when we're fearful of the hospital 
I uh, I have a sibling who's just about to have a baby, so I have lots of um, intense prayers for all those who have to live in hospital world. Um, so yeah, so Dr. Marty, when he went around, he like figured out that we didn't have a language for loneliness and he really wanted to draw attention to that issue. And so, um, and it's kind of amazing. I think we're all starting to realize that there's like more and more need for that kind of language. Like, uh, in Britain, the, they named a minister of loneliness. Oh, and there he is. Hello. I'm here. You're doing great. We're waiting to go live. It's going to go. Oh, hey. Why am I over there? <laughs> One second, guys. Sorry. We're learning so many things. Hey, why did I move? Come back. Why am I around over there? Why is it the opposite side of my house? Guys, guys, guys. How am I learning things? <laughs> I flipped my own thing around. Okay, come on, Kate Bowler. Get it together. Get it together, Kate Bowler. <laughs> It said go live with, geez Louise, I know I have to switch my camera, but I can't. Oh, there it is. It's just the twister on one. Guys, make cameras easier for professors. We don't know what we're doing most of the time. That's our whole thing. That's our, <laughs> it's our whole thing. Have you seen me? Never. No one here has seen me try to create a PowerPoint video where, um, I don't know how to turn anything off, Elizabeth, but that does sound like a really good idea. <laughs> I will learn for next time, though, I promise. Okay, here we go. We're going to do it. Go live. I can feel it. And I'll try not to turn my camera around this time. Um, at Duke Divinity School, there was always this tech guy named Reed who I was best friends with. Hey, there we are! Hey, how are you, Kate? <laughs> I was talking all about you. Things I said. Oh. One, you are the nicest person ever. Two, you are deeply soulful. Three, <laughs> as your time in uh, as Surgeon General, you went around uh, learning all about people's needs. And when you were there, you realized that people needed a deeper language for loneliness and that we didn't quite have the texture for that. And yet now, in the midst of all of this social isolation, like, you, you, my friend, are exactly who we need to talk to. So I'm so grateful that you made the time and that you also have this really perfectly timed book that will come out next month called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. Now possibly revised to deeply lonely world, just like asterisks. Um, so I, if you don't mind, can we, because I know you don't have that much time. I'll, can I start with the big stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, can you tell me something first, Kate? How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for asking. Yeah. yeah. Are you doing okay? I know it's so intense for you right now. Yeah, no, I'm doing okay. I mean, fortunately, I'm, I'm here in Miami, actually. I usually live in Washington, D.C., but I'm in Miami with my, my parents and my sister and my wife yeah. and kids. We're all together, which makes it easier. Yeah. But sometimes that's hard for high-capacity people to, like, not be able to be out there as much. So I'm sure it's... I'm sure it's like a mixed bag for you. Yeah, it's okay. We're managing. <laughs> yeah. Aww. I um, I I wanted to start with something that we talked about in the podcast that I think really resonated with people and really might help right now. You talked about how the more when we're trying to understand the sort of geography of connection that people that everybody needs people. Like, there's just nothing wrong with saying like. Sometimes I feel really lonely. That's right. That's right. There's this unfortunate stigma around loneliness that makes people feel ashamed if they're lonely. And, and I felt that a lot as a kid who struggled with loneliness. Somehow it, to say you're lonely me feels like saying I'm not likable or I'm not loved. And nobody wants to feel that way. But, but the reality is that all of us need people. We, and it's not just a nice thing to say. It's actually a biological part of how we evolve. Uh, we evolve to need each other, to depend on each other for protection and for support. And so naturally, when we don't have connections with each other, we feel lonely. And the way to think about loneliness is the same way we think about hunger and thirst, as a natural response to something that our body is telling us that we need. Yeah, yeah. And we don't have to have everyone like sometimes with the hyper connection and we feel like we should have a million people, but you, you gave me like a modest goal for friendship. 
I swear to you, this is like really stuck with me. And I tell a zillion people, I'm like, no, 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 three people. <laughs> that's what you said. Is that, <laughs> I think that's really helpful for people to know, like, there's, you can just have, you can have, you need three people to call when something is bad. That's right. You know, I think quality matters more than quantity. And we live in a quantity driven world, right, where people are trying to rack up as many friends as they can on Facebook or followers on Instagram or on Twitter. And, and we're somehow led to believe by the trappings of modern culture that our self worth is directly correlated to how many people we around us or how many people support us. But the reality is that a lot of if you talk to people who have millions of followers on Twitter, a lot of them actually feel quite lonely. Um, because all of those followers don't fill the gaps that we need. The only thing that fills the human gap that all of us crave is true, authentic, deep connection. Connection where we can truly be ourselves with somebody else and they can do the same with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's so, and people are, so people wrote in with questions they had for you and there's some really beautiful ones about like, really trying to figure out some of the texture around connection right now, especially because everyone's shifting to this totally different way of interacting where it's primarily digital. And so uh, we had um, a lovely question from someone who just said, look, for people who are widowed or already alone for other reasons and are trying to build new connections, how do we, how do we reach for meaningful connections in the age of COVID? Yeah, you know, there is something that is really interesting and, and I think challenging about the current time. You know, with COVID-19, we're being told to physically distance from each other, and that's really hard. Uh, I think everyone is struggling with not being able to see family and friends and being cooped up in their homes or in their neighborhoods. But there, I think, is a potential bright side to this as well, which is that the fact that so many people almost universally are feeling a sense of anguish and pain about this gives us an opportunity to be real with others and to be open about the fact that we're struggling. Now, if you go up to somebody and say, hey, it's been really tough for me, how are you doing? You don't have to wonder, worry that they're gonna say, oh no, it's everything, everything's been great for me. You're the one who's struggling. Because all of us are really struggling and people are, are pretty open about that now. Yeah. It gives us a chance to, to connect with people uh, on the grounds that we're, we're going through a collective experience of pain and difficulty. Yeah. But I think, what, and I think one of the most important things that we can do in this moment is actually to take the initiative to reach out to others, uh, whether they're family or friends, whether they're people we've spoken to a lot or have rarely been in touch with, but just to reconnect, just check on them, to see how they're doing, and then to be open with them about how you're doing. My, my guess is that 90% of the time, if not more, if you take the initiative to reach out to somebody in your life right now, to ask how they're doing and to reconnect, they will likely welcome that outreach. And I suspect that you will feel a lot better after that interaction, even if it's only a five or 10 minute conversation. Yeah, 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 that's great. Cause I, I like what you're saying too about like the social permission we should feel. Like if loneliness is shameful in, in a normal time in COVID, it gives us a chance to say like, no, actually things are not going that well or, <laughs> Or they were this morning, but now it's five and I just can't. I think it, it like opens up the possibility not to feel, because for me, the word is always like pathetic. Like I always feel a bit pathetic when I'm like running low mm -hmm. and just to just like have that minute just to be a little bit more real. Yeah. COVID-19 is normalized loneliness. So I think we can feel much more open talking about it, recognizing a lot of us at the same time. Yeah. There's a lot of people here we have this beautiful community around every, the everything happens project and there's like two different communities that we just love so much and one is we have we have like people who are experiencing fragility and then we have all the caregivers who love them so i just kind of wanted to ask a question for both like for the caregivers you are a caregiver you have a huge heart for other doctors and nurses and healthcare workers right now like what what kind of message of hope do you have for people who are currently living through like maybe more than anyone wanted to sign up for? Yeah, you know, the, there are a lot of people in the in our population, our community, who are really struggling right now. People who are on the poor in terms of already being isolated, perhaps because they had a disability and couldn't get out as often, uh, or maybe they're older and over time they've lost friends. 
Um, and they were struggling before. And then when this came, especially for elderly people who are in uh, nursing homes or facilities which are now under great scrutiny, those facilities have said no more visitors because we don't want the infection to spread. And one of the consequences of that is that people are even more alone than they were before. Uh, for healthcare workers also, a different type of strain, but many healthcare workers are also feeling like they've got to go to work and put their lives on the line, even though they don't have the masks and protection they need. They're worried about their families, about exposing them, about not being there for them. So the stresses are, are different on, on all of us, but there are a lot of there are particular groups that are really struggling right now. Yeah. And what I would say, though, is that as painful as this is, one good thing is we know this will end. We can't put an exact finger on when it will end, but we know it will end. And I believe that if we, if we keep this moment in our minds and in our hearts, we remember the pain of disconnection, but use that as an opportunity to recenter ourselves on the power of connection and to prioritize connection in our lives once this lifts. I actually think that we can come out of this uh, living even more connected lives than before, living, as I think of it, a people-centered life, instead of the life that, that we are often nudged to lead by the dominant culture in which we live, which is a life that's centered around wealth, power, and power. Yeah, yeah. Man, because interdependence, we've been like socialized out of it. And all of our stories are that we're supposed to be okay by ourselves. And then moments like this, like we just, we know, we know we're not okay by ourselves because we are officially beyond our limit. And like all the national stories of like invincibility and they're just, they feel, they just are tinny in our mouth right now, I think. And I, I love what you're saying about just wanting to be able to like, my friend, um, Ray said when making like hard choices about what to do, I was thinking medical choices or even just how much we have to spend on other people, like to notice the calendar of like what we had as resources when we had it and make a choice based on like what we know then. And then like give ourselves credit later for the lessons we learned in that moment. So like that we can remember like it was a Friday for Christian times, like day bazillion of Lent. <laughs> <laughs> and that moment, we remember, we remember that we really needed each other and we weren't okay alone. And then we, we, and we were never supposed to be okay alone. That's right. We weren't. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were designed to need each other. And I think that's true in a biological sense. I personally think that's true in a spiritual sense. Um, but I think we're seeing that played out in even, even rarefied terms given the COVID-19 epidemic. And I would just say to everyone out there who's listening to to think about the people you know in your life who may be more vulnerable, the people who may have struggled with loneliness or depression before this all began, the people who are elderly and who might have less of an ability to go out at baseline and now might be struggling as they're even more isolated. Think about the, the nurses and the doctors and the people you know who work in hospitals and clinics and about how they, as well as the people who are working in grocery stores and who are still working with an Uber driver, are putting their health on the line every time they go out, but they're doing that because they're trying to serve other people. And even reaching out to them with a short message, whether you text them or email them, whether you call them or send them a short video saying, I'm thinking about you. Um, I, I, I don't think I can emphasize how powerful those short messages can be in lifting someone up and helping them feel seen and appreciated and giving them the boost that they need for that day. Yeah. yeah. Even just like the other day, um, I, uh, I was thinking about what you said about loneliness and especially people who are older who might lose some of those connections. And I called like the old couple that used to uh, drive me to the hospital and every, and I only knew them in that period because they were just like those lovely people that sign up to care for sad people like me. <laughs> and uh, I had talked to them for like a year and called them up and was like, Hey, how are you? Are you, you know, are you by yourselves? And they were like, Oh, don't worry. We traded you in for a 102 year old named Myrtle. <laughs> and I was like, I bet she's better. <laughs> but like, just like, it's such a good prompt right now to like return to some of those people that we just assume someone else is taking care of, but maybe nobody is. That's right. I, um, there was a, a question from Jess about how do we support people who might not be, who are non-tech savvy family members who might be high risk or living alone during this time? Yeah, so we have to adopt our communication to what people uh, can see, right? So if you've got 
an elderly relative who's in a nursing home who you can't visit, but they just can't quite figure out FaceTime. Yeah. Then, you know, call them on the phone. If they can't quite figure out their cell phone, call them on the landline facility. Um, if none of that works, you know, go really old school and write them a letter. That's crazy. Yeah. That yeah. uh, or write them an email. Uh, however you communicate, yeah. it is the, the most powerful thing is people knowing that you're thinking of them. Yeah knowing that you're that they are in your thoughts and i would also say when you reach out to somebody and talk to them on the phone or video conference with them uh, give them your full attention one of the greatest gifts that we can give other people is the gift of our full attention. it's when we focus on other people fully that's when we listen deeply that's when we bring our full selves to the conversation and if we're honest with ourselves in the modern world we are really distracted a lot because we have so much pulling at our attention. You know, and I'm, I've been guilty of talking to a friend on the phone and then somehow I find myself 10 minutes later checking email on my phone or refreshing my social media feed yeah. or watching the news on TV. And, you know, these are, we have all kinds of seductive pulls, uh, you know, that draw our attention away from the conversation we're having. But this isn't a moment for us to really go deep in terms of our interactions with other people. You don't always need a lot of time to have a deeply meaningful connection. What you need is the quality. You need to show up fully as who you are. And if you do that, and even five minutes can make a huge difference to both of you. Yeah. Yeah, but that's also your special superpower. I swear to you. I think you're like, you're good at the like, whoop. Like you like feel it. You're like friends with you for two seconds and you feel it in your little heart. I've already. I've already decided that I'm signing up to be part of your PR team now where I just like go around and be like, look. <laughs> That dude is soulful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one more question. Um, how do we help young kids deal with the isolation and confusion? I, uh, like, I, my son today, he's just like, you know, he's an only child, so he's just like, I, where are all my friends? And we tried one thing, we tried, um, it was like a little lunch buddies program where you can sign up for FaceTime and he got to like sit and eat his chicken nuggets with someone else that he knew. <laughs> like any, any ideas for like either the confusion or the isolation that some of the tiny people in our lives are facing? Yeah, so this is real. And I gotta tell you, I have talked to so many parents uh, who are struggling and I'm a parent also of two kids who are three and two. And uh, it's, man, the struggle's real. It's, it's, it's really tough to keep them engaged. We're also trying to work here on the side and keep them safe. They don't understand why they can't go see their friends. You know, it's a, uh, this is hard. I do think there are a couple of things we can consider though. I think one is kids, they tend to draw their energy in many ways from the people they're around. And so if their parents are anxious and stressed, um, then that will filter through. I don't say this to induce guilt. Look, this is a stressful time for all yeah, of us. Yeah, yeah. I'll put the burden on ourselves to feel like we've got to be zen and calm all the time. But it does mean, I think, as we think about what we need to build into our life as parents, that having even five minutes, you know, a, a day, ideally longer, for just solitude, where we can just sit and breathe, yeah. where we can recenter ourselves, is really important. And if we can even do that with our kids for five minutes, uh, that's actually really powerful. You know, with our son, we, when he was really young, we taught him just to take deep breaths with us uh, together. Um, and it became this thing that he would just start doing. Like when he got really mad, we would say, okay, now's our time to take a deep breath. Deep breath, breath in and deep breath out. And he'd blow it out. And we would just do that together. And it was a very simple breath meditation, but one that kind of became a tradition for us to do at times of high stress. And little things like that that we with our kids, whether it's deep breathing, whether it's taking time to actually look at them fully and engage with them for five yeah. minutes. Yeah. These, again, are powerful. And for all the parents out there, they know this, what I'm about to say, but they know that five minutes of quality time with your child can carry them uh, for a while. Yeah. And I suspect in five years, Kate, or in 10 years, or in 20 years, when we look on, back on this period of time, many of us might say, God, this was an incredibly painful period. We were stress we couldn't go out and do things we couldn't see people we were worried about our jobs like there was economic anxiety but i wonder what our kids will say because i'm not sure i wonder if if we play this right maybe our kids will say you know this is a time where you didn't look at your phone so much we just hung out together uh where we ate dinner together every night and we don't normally do that where we took walks together, 
in the woods or down the street as a family because we had the time to do that. Um, this is actually a really nice time in my life. Yeah. Our children actually say that. And yeah. so I think that what we just need to focus on as parents is giving ourselves a few minutes a day for that that deep breathing for the serenity uh, so yeah. that we can find our anchors. Yeah. And I think to the extent with our kids, um, that we can spend a little bit of time with them also doing something that we find to be a high quality or full attention yeah. is on them. That's taking a walk or playing with them, reading them a story. These are powerful. And I don't think we have to worry as parents about solving every minute of the day. Like if we can't do the lesson plan that we mapped out at the beginning of the week, that's okay. If we can't get them to engage with the distance learning, with the videos that the school has sent, that's yeah. okay too. Yeah, but my son's illiterate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, look, if he could read, my life would be so much easier right now. <laughs> I'm trying to get my three-year-old to rapidly like figure out how to read. Like, You're like, cool, cool, cool. This is an S. This is a T. <laughs> I totally hear you. Yeah, I love that. I love your, like, you just, you have this, I think, personal, also deeply well-researched, loving pitch for being comfortable around needing each other. Our little people need us as batteries. Our older people need us as batteries, but we are made for each other. And thanks so much for coming on here. And, and, and we'll save this for later and we'll give other people a chance to watch this. But like, you're exactly the person that I hope everyone gets to hear to talk about connection in a time of deep loneliness. And I really hope everyone picks up your book because like I, I have really, really enjoyed knowing that like you get that we, um, we were always supposed to feel like this, just like a little bit, a little bit connected, wanting for more. Well, that's so kind of you, Kay. You know, this is such a joy to be on with you. Oh, ever okay. since we first uh, got in touch and ever since our first podcast conversation, I've, I've deeply admired not just your work, but your spirit. And oh, thanks, Fred. So thanks for this opportunity to be together again. And to everyone who is listening, uh, stay safe and be well. I hope we'll have a chance to talk again soon. <laughs> thanks. I don't know how to turn this off. I will learn during this time. And also, <laughs> just so you know, we're permanently friends. You can't get out of it. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, I'm happy right. being friends. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to your family for me, okay? Thanks. And my yeah. best to your family, too, Kate. I know. And thanks so much to everyone for joining us. This has been so great. We love you all. Thank you for our caregivers. And thank you for those who are fragile. You teach us every day how to be delicate. We love you so much. Bye, guys.